Good afternoon and welcome to the Creative Pathfinders webinar series. I'd like to begin by thanking some of my colleagues for their support in this webinar series. I want to thank Claire Davison and her team in the Office of Advancement in the College of Arts and Sciences for facilitating these webinar events. And also Kevin Leonardi, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications and Digital Accessibility Coordinator, Christopher Wallace, for their amazing support as we uh, developed our Barnett Center website to reflect this series. And also to Alison Kaboski at the Barnett Center for her amazing administrative support as we embarked on this rather rapid reworking of our website to showcase the Creative Pathfinders initiative. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Department of Art who participated in the nomination process to identify our Creative Pathfinder, Elizabeth Gerdeman, who is joining us today from her home in Leipzig, Germany. Lastly, I want to extend my gratitude to Marian van der Heiden, Director of the Urban Art Space and Hopkins Hall Gallery at OSU for taking the time to facilitate this discussion with Elizabeth this afternoon. Creative Pathfinders was created to strengthen our connection to our alumni network. So if you are an alumni in the audience, we welcome you back with open arms. And we wanted to celebrate the contributions of some of our alumni within their respective fields. And so now we've created this initiative and perhaps now more than ever, we wanna remember why we need the arts. I wanted to make a space through Creative Pathfinders where we can turn towards each other and take some time to marvel at the courageous and singular career paths of each of the alumni that we will jo be joined by during this series. As I mentioned, Elizabeth Gerdeman is an alumni of our MFA program in the Department of Art, and she graduated in 2008 and is currently living and working in Leipzig, Germany. She shows her work internationally, as is evidenced in the short bio that I'm placing in our chat. She's joined by Marijn van der Heiden, who's Director of Urban Art Space, and also earned her MFA degree from the Department of Art in 1997. So we have two alumna here in this opening discussion who have both embarked in careers abroad, and I can't wait to listen in on their conversation. We will begin by having Elizabeth frame her practice for us, followed by some questions from Marijn with time at the end um, for questions from our audience. So I'll hand it over to Elizabeth now as she shares her work and ideas with us for a few minutes. Thank you, Allison. I'm really delighted and honored to be here today. So just give me a moment and I'll queue up my presentation. All right, so I've created a brief overview of my work, which is divided into three parts. So for the intro, I actually wanted to go back to the influences and in research that really crystallized when I was in graduate school at OSU, which also continues to form the basis for much of my work today. So I'm often triggered by experiences in the house paint section of home improvement stores, which is filled with paper paint samples each with a specific name and number. And I'm fascinated by how many of these paints meant for an interior environment are accompanied by texts and images evoking an often pristine natural exterior world, such as this campaign by Valspar titled The Beauty Goes On, showing quote, breathtakingly beautiful natural scenes with a square missing which appears as a paper paint sample at the bottom of the ad. The marketing director of this campaign said, Valspar is one paint company seeking to utilize emotions rather than color. Also stating, when we asked customers, they told us that painting is an emotional journey with lots of highs and lows. Soon thereafter, Olympic Paint also unveiled new collections as part of an alliance with the National Audubon Society. A quote from the campaign states that it allowed customers to bring the brilliant hues of the natural world indoors providing a connection with the landscapes that inspire them. And additionally, each brochure features corresponding paint color samples with names such as Alpine Valley and Quaking Grass. 
So this is another paint color sample titled Grand Canyon from Benjamin Moore Paint Company. And it made me think about early paintings of the Grand Canyon and ask questions like, does a paint sample titled Grand Canyon have something to do with a painting such as this of a similar title? Are advertisement companies aiming to evoke similar emotional responses in their viewers as the 19th century romantic painters of the sublime American landscape? How does this compare to adapting the sublime as an aesthetic and experiential point of view that requires sufficient distance from the actual dangers of nature in order to find it pleasing in its overwhelming vastness? And thinking about how in the course of the 19th century, nature and its sublimity came to also be seen in nationalistic terms, where nature was emblematic of America's size, strength, cultural and economic potential, as well as its materialistic potential. So at the same time, I was researching landscape theory and learning more about what it is that landscape actually does, how landscape functions not simply as an object to be seen or a text to be read, but as an instrument of cultural force, a central tool in the creation of national and social identities. And in the influential book, Landscape and Power, there is a W.J.T. Mitchell's thesis on landscape which consists of nine points. And the ones that stand out most for me are numbers one and four. Landscape is not a genre of art, but a medium. Landscape is a natural scene mediated by culture. It is both a represented and presented space, both a signifier and a signified, both a frame and what a frame contains, both a real place and its simulacrum, both a package and the commodity inside the package. So this translates in my work as an examination of the often conflicting ways that we conceive of the natural world, questioning how images combining landscape and dwellings in advertising and in art influence the contemporary value of nature, home, and place. So my approach is multidisciplinary. Um, I work with a wide range of materials and images to create room scale paintings or mixed media collages interior decor inspired installations and also experimental videos. So sometimes this manifests as wall paintings, amalgamations of forms and colors that are appropriated from some of the romantic paintings that we just saw. Other times the forms are based more on the layers of history and the specific geology related to an area. The most often the forms that are chosen are dictated by the name of the paint color itself. So mountaintop gray, pine green or gold meadow, for example or the paint colors and forms could be directly related to the place where the artwork is actually installed. So I understand landscape and art as being entwined in broader social makings. In some works, I examine landscape in fear and the role of exaggerated perceptions of the world around us. I also continue to glean visual cues and materials from the home improvement industry, which uses images of nature as a design element and branding tool. So what is at stake when paint products use aspects of landscape to evoke emotional responses in consumers, stimulating us to bring romanticized notions of the natural environment into our own dwellings? So most of my exhibitions combine various materials and techniques within the framework of a social theoretic approach to landscape, often from the protective distance and perspective of the indoors. So in this case, plastic tarp flecked with paint remnants can serve as curtains or colors can appear as light that's framed within the space or as a painted sunrise or sunset gradation. Videos can double as shadows that are cast by windblown trees and hand printed monotypes on transparent sheets can capture pigment water stains like window glass. Though with all of the installative environments that I create, nothing is quite as it seems as views of the exterior and the interior ultimately present a multiplicity of insider and outsider meanings, desires, and anxieties. Ultimately, what I'm asking is, in what new ways are humans tied to their environment? So for my site-specific work, I respond more to the forms found in situ, in addition to the history and use of landscape imagery in that particular area. So here, using the context of a Baroque mansion under renovation, this series explores the spaces between interior and exterior environments, their representation, decoration, organization, and reflexivity, especially the repetition of found forms as borders, frames, and boundaries to be questioned or crossed. The cultural construction of landscape as practiced by contemporary industries is frequently interrogated within my work. 
So how do we imagine areas of redevelopment? What is their inherent value both before and after this process of renovation? And how are the environments of those who live there affected? Some of the site-specific words I create actually take place on our devices, playing with the notion of plein air painting, for example, and travel for artists to inspirational destinations remotely. Other experimental videos consist of fictive journeys through collages of paint brochures and tourism advertisements, as if following one's finger along as it points to illustrations in a book or a field guide as a form of visual narrative. So are images of the sublime in need of inversion or subversion in order to keep their summits within reach of our daily lives? Rural areas such as these seem to integrate nature and culture, yet neither rejecting civilization nor fully embracing wilderness. The materials and forms of each piece, the installative situations in which these works were developed and presented, and the context of the village and its residents are found and imbued within the site itself, both its historical and current functions and utilizations. My work also recognizes that images are powerful. For better or worse, they possess the ability to alter perspectives and influence views. They shape and change the way we see and ultimately think about the world. So when images can be taken in the hand and thrust into the air, held up as an ideal we strive towards or as an ailment that we demand remedied, they can also transform into a form of protest. My hope with this work is that these present day images will soon serve as documentation of landscapes past and a reminder of what was fought against. So for this final section of the overview, I am going to highlight three recent projects. This particular project was realized in two parts, exploring the often troubling yet alluring dualities and contradictions inherently presented within the city of Venice, Italy. Many of the individual works were brought to areas at the thresholds of interior dwellings and exterior surroundings. The second part of the series delves into aspects of Venice's darker side, and it was created when I was there during the period of the worst flooding of the city on record. The desire to capture this dichotomy for me stems from the myriad presentations and imaginings of the city, combined with intersections of painting and environment, abstraction and landscape. A psychogeographic approach, investigating the influence that architecture, space and atmosphere has on perception, was something that I utilized as a means of exploration. Here, drift and wandering came into play both within an urban environment and with the visual media. This series presents a seeping of one struggle or demarcation between disparities and binaries into another. Tendrils and washes of thought and action ultimately soak into surfaces, forever staining them, while also highlighting fluctuating and unstable qualities. Melding notions of floating with sinking, the series binds recent histories with potential futures amid a tenuous present existence between worlds. So for this project, I created a piece that was uh, specifically for a billboard display that's located outside of a gallery on the grounds of the Spinnerei, uh, which is an arts and cultural hub here in Leipzig. Points of departure for this work are highlighting and interrogating both the significance and the dangers of viewing whilst confronting notions of fear. Fear associated with both exterior and interior or internal external environments and how these fears may seep in through various openings, outlets or windows to the outside world. So during this time marked with heightened anxiety when threats can overwhelm, this piece promotes the desire to recognize and reflect fact from fiction, to seek truth among the shadows especially within the confines or walls of our own minds. Most importantly, it's to combat ways in which fear can control and shape our perceptions, crippling reason and rendering us powerless. So we've come to the final project I will discuss, uh, which was inspired by the Course of Empire series of paintings by American Romantic painter, Thomas Cole, in which he traced the rise, glory and inevitable destruction of an imaginary civilization that ultimately ends in ruin. So this piece that I created was inspired more by the fifth and final painting in Cole's series, uh, which is titled Desolation. A review of the work describes it as, we view the remains of the city. The landscape has begun to return to wilderness and no humans are to be seen, but the remnants of their architecture emerge 
from beneath the overgrowth. So I'm thinking about nature after humans and I began researching the plants that are expected to survive us and also those that could potentially sustain us. And I created abstracted versions of these forms in combination with spray paint colors that contain names referencing places under threat, such as Great Barrier Reef Coral or Miami Palm Green or Venice Teal. So these pieces were hung like battle tattered banners were methods of severing, so to cut free, and tearing, so to rend by holding or restraining and pulling apart, were utilized as both forms of creation and acts of violence. And though many hundreds, I'm told, virtually toured the work, painfully timely perhaps, it has nevertheless been installed in a room that is otherwise surrounded by silence since last year. And that concludes the overview of my work. And I think that provides a terrific starting point for our conversation, Elizabeth. Thank you. That was really terrific presentation. In fact, I think this, this prompts a whole new conversation that we could probably be having um, on Zoom about your work. I uh, have so many questions and you know, things I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, for today's talk, I really would like to focus a little bit more about um, your professional development and essentially, basically, the strategies that relate to your career choices and the things that you do to sustain your art practice. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a focused conversation, but hopefully we will get to touch a little bit on some of your work as well. I wanted to start off really by asking you about um, Talk to us a little more about growing up in Columbus, in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, and your family. I I read that you um, that you considered um, that you have many mentors um, in your life, but that among the greatest mentors uh, were members of your family who really encouraged you um, in your budding art practice from your time at Fort Hayes to CCAD and then Ohio State. Um, I think you graduated with your BFA from CCAD in 2004 and then your MFA degree in art from Ohio State in 2008, right? So if you would talk to us a little bit more about um, the encouragement specifically you received and how that prepared you for, for everything that you're doing now. Yes, well, you're absolutely right. There were so many different mentors and um, that I had in my life and um, perhaps unexpected ones. I mean, there were teachers and other people that made me recognize what they considered to be talents that I had and they encouraged me. For example, when I was in elementary school, if my art teacher hadn't said, you know, if you uh, go to the Columbus College of Art and Design on this Saturday, they're actually having a test. And um, if you pass, then they could potentially offer you a scholarship to partake in their Saturday morning art classes. So just knowing that those opportunities were available um, opened up a whole other perspective for me as to what I could be doing with my time. Um, in the neighborhood where I come from, I think that um, it's certainly, the path that I've taken in as far as higher education is concerned, it must be said that I am the first in my family to receive a college degree. So it was not a necessarily clear one. Um, and I think it's because the ways in which to get there weren't known to us at the time, uh, certainly not to me. And so um, I didn't begin going to school full time actually at the Columbus College of Art and Design until I was 21. And something that really happened to, uh, uh, that affected this path that I'm on um, was my participation in AmeriCorps. Um, I was in the Children of the Future program that was facilitated by the Greater Columbus Arts Council um, from the time that I was 19 until I was 21. And um, this was an after school program for um, what were labeled at risk inner city youth. And um, feeling like that's something that I would have been called at some point in my life as well. I thought that that was something necessary that I wanted to be a part of. And it also provided um, a stipend available um, for um, higher education. So these were all things that I was thinking about that really sort of affected 
my path and so inspired me. Yeah. Uh, that's incredible. And you're right, absolutely. I think mentors and people who encourage you, who who show you possibilities, right? And and um, have a way of pointing out um, not only ways to go, but also encourage you in doing the kinds of things that you enjoy and that you're good at. It sounds like Fort Hayes may have been one of those places as well, you know, in terms of your development. Um, you mentioned something around the idea that uh, you learned there um, to really kind of stick with your practice, to develop your art practice, to, to find kind of like a sustenance around that. Yes, and also to um, seek out other creative individuals or, or other individuals that were um, navigating the space of their life to include the creative practice as part of it. Um, and so that was something too that I learned by going to Fort Hayes and being around other creative people. And um, it was something that I knew that I wanted to have also in, in my post high school adult life. Um, so I was going to try to find a way to be involved in that regardless. I think before I started college, I was, um, uh, I was working at Utrecht, you know, the art supply store in Columbus as a way to get in contact. You know, I was a, um, an assistant manager uh, after high school of that store. And um, then I was actually um, working with people that were attending CCAD. And so um, I thought, well, how am I gonna do this? I need to, what do I need to do? I need to develop a portfolio. Okay, classes are expensive. I'm gonna have to pay for this. Maybe I should take evening classes at the Columbus College of Art and Design first and you know, make sure that they will transfer and then speak to an advisor about doing that and then finally apply and uh, have a portfolio ready. And so, step by step, but I think a lot of it has to do with um, recognizing the need for a community of individuals that will um, inspire, potentially, you know, assist, um, but provide a, a, a platform for you to be able to pursue the path by, by learning from example. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like today we, you know, we, we call that network and we always emphasize network in everything that we do. And yeah, that's, I think, being diligent about that and seeking that out and always casting your net wide is um, your beautiful example of that. I wanted to ask you, you so shortly after graduating with your MFA degree uh, from Ohio State, you won a Greater Columbus Arts Council sponsored artist residency in Dresden, Germany in 2009, and then spent much of the following year in Dresden. Um, I'm, so now you are in Leipzig, Germany, and I'm so curious to learn a little more about how um, you got to Leipzig and, and when you moved there. Well, um, going from Dresden to Leipzig is not so Far. Um, it's still within the same state in Germany. So, um, and when I had, um, well, the, 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 the idea was that I would, I've always wanted to live in a different country. And it was after my time through the Greater Columbus Arts Council Artist Residency Grant in Dresden that I even started to think that that might be possible, that I could understand after the three months of doing the residency, what it would take to, to maintain a, and sustain a studio practice and to think about how I would actually provide for myself uh, for, in a fiduciary means of support, you know, working and living and having to deal with, with the bureaucracy in another country. These are things I, I was actually thinking about doing. And then once I did start to do it, I thought maybe it would be for a year. I'll try it for a year, see what happens. I can always come back. I love my hometown and I have my network there. And uh, so, but then of course, you know, years later, here I am. Um, so yes, when I was in Dresden, actually, um, Leipzig ended up receiving the, the label of being Heipzig. Um, and this happened just a couple of years after I had moved here. And um, in that sense, it was being called like the new Berlin or the better Berlin, cooler Berlin. And so um, there were a lot of, uh, it still are, off spaces and, um, vacant buildings and a sense of urgency with um, it being uh, a city where a lot of people were relocating to. And actually at one point, more people were moving to Leipzig than to Berlin. So um, I don't know if that's still the case, but um, so population increase. And of course we know that, that when that happens, you know, artists are usually the trailblazers for interesting areas and thinking about how we can utilize different spaces in creative ways. 
that's always mixed in with the the big G word, right? Gentrification and how that's going to happen. So and is happening. Um, so it's been it's been an, an interesting experience to be in Leipzig. However, I think as far as landscape is concerned, I must say that it it seems a bit like a lateral move. I mean, uh, it's relatively flat, like Columbus. Um, it's dotted with little rivers that kind of go through, and in between are woods and bike paths and things like that. So a lot of parks. So in that sense, it's very much, um, <laughs> it provides a parallel to my experience in Columbus, aesthetically at least, yeah. Uh, that's, I, it's so interesting to me. And I'm actually, this reminds me, I'm, I'm really curious about some of your familial ties as well. In one of your writings, you shared a memory about seeing a landscape through a train window while you were in Germany then remarking on the similarities in topography as you just did between, you know, of course, the Midwest and central Germany and reminding you of your grandmother, Antonia, and how she must have experienced the central Ohio landscape when she um, immigrated, you know, when she came to the United States in, um, in the early 20th century. Yes. I'm, I'm, and I'm curious, you know, in terms of familial ties, if, if Germany was always the place that you thought you might um, search out just because, because your family's from there? Um, not necessarily. I think that that was something that was very much a, a coincidence. And that was also sort of paved by the experiences that I had by being a part of the uh, artist residency. Um, but yes, yeah, so my great grandmother, Antonia, um, and um, then her husband that she met here, actually in a German village, right, uh, immigrated in uh, 1925. And so um, they met in German village and then my grandmother, who was a very strong influence uh, for me, uh, she was born in German village. So this was when German village was actually a neighborhood in Columbus that was uh, con that consisted primarily of German speaking inhabitants. And so that was something that was always in the back of my mind and uh, something that was uh, a part of my, my familial identity, but it was still something that wasn't, um, it wasn't determined that I would go to Germany or that I would ever go anywhere <laughs> to, you know, and particularly to live, but I always wanted to, that desire to, to be a part of a different culture was something that I thought I really wanted to do. And um, I really think that some of these experiences um, really shaped my desire to want to live abroad. So, I mean, I thought that spending a couple of years, you know, in a different culture would be a great benefit, especially because you know my goals, they included personal growth and development, um, but also I wanted to have valuable exposure to connections into a broader art world, and um, particularly in a country, yes, that has my familial ties, but also, you know, where cutting-edge um, art movements are occurring, and um, yeah, I just uh, it's a country that you know is connected to my own family history and sense of place, so. I'm glad that I had the opportunity to do that. Yeah, and I was reading some more of your writing and know that you're interested in, as you say, examining the complex intersections of migration and immigration between personal histories and generalized representations. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious, you know, what you've learned or what have you learned about the idea of home through your work? Um, I know that you've talked about these dualities and that they exist inside of you. You know, this idea of feeling at home everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And I just can't help but ask you, because um, I've got my own experience with that, you know, having, having come here from the Netherlands, um, in my case, and settling in Columbus. Yes, well, um, I think that the quote that you read that I had written before about, uh, feeling at home everywhere and nowhere simultaneously um, being, I, there is something that when you do leave home and anyone that's ever left home, it, regardless of how great of a geographic distance it might be, right? Um, we all know that there is no going back to the home that we left before because we've changed, our, perspe our perspectives have changed, um, we've grown, 
Um, we've had different experiences that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So um, in that sense, I think that a home is a desire and a feeling of being comfortable with oneself, regardless of where they are, and to be able to try to recognize what their own strengths and weaknesses are, and to be able to um, understand how those aspects play out in any place that someone is located, and to try to take best opportunities and advantage of the situations that are presented to them, but also to be um, aware of those opportunities when they do occur. So um, in that sense, I feel like home can be found hopefully anywhere for anyone when they are looking at it from that perspective. Easier said than done. And I think it's a, a process of becoming as well. How do we become um, home? How do we come home? How do we become into a place where we feel comfortable? So, and I feel like that's something that, you know, first starts with ourselves, of course. And I love that notion, this, this idea of becoming and carrying that inside of you. You know, I think I can relate to that so much. And this conversation and also ties so much into landscape again and the ways we see and maybe idealize, you know, the outer world and use these kind of perfect places as stand-ins, maybe sometimes conflate them with, you know, our anxieties and desires and, you know, our need to belong somewhere. But, you know, I feel like that's that's a conversation that you and I need to have. I'm, I'm curious to have is, um, I'm gonna focus this a little bit differently. I wanna talk about your writing. You write a lot. And you mentioned in one of your writings that art can be deceptive. Um, can you talk a bit more about that? and? you know, how you use your writing specifically, both for yourself, but also as a means to gain clarity um, for, an, for an audience. Yes, um, writing has been, I think it is sort of deeply implicated in the practice of an artist and a visual artist. I think we're expected in many ways uh, to be able to not only describe what it is that we're doing, um, but to discuss it, uh, to write about it, to speak about it. And so language is just so deeply implicated in all of that. And I feel like um, the way in which I learn, you know, a lot of people they learn from, from doing or from seeing, and of course I am a visual person, but I think that I really um, understand something through through language, through, through reading it and definitely through writing it, which is why for my presentation, I wanted to have text as well as image. You can hear the cadence of my voice when I speak. And I feel like all of these things are very important to how we understand and how we learn. Um, so, and I think writing is a way, I think of it about like, I think of drawing as a means for me to have this understanding of the, maybe the contours or the gestures of a concept to make it a little bit more tangible. So yeah, that's how I see writing in my practice. And I would agree, it's a, it's a different kind of exploration. You know, ones that can potentially gesture at a larger scope or sometimes um, allow you to tumble into yet related concepts. You know, I think just as, as, as language has its own tangents, right? Uh, art practice like drawing has its own tangents. And, sometimes like little mistakes can lead to, you know, kind of eye-opening discoveries um, or little, you know, misspellings even, for example. And uh, yeah, I love that. Um, one of you, um, I, I would like for you to share a little more about how you conduct your research and what that process of making looks like for you. So, you know, I don't know if there's a specific structure, for example, to your day. Um, and, you know, I'm also thinking about, given that your work is so focused on the landscape, like do you walk a lot? Like, what does your practice look like? Well, um, my practice, everything begins really with a triggering experience. And the triggering experience could be something like what I had described, you know, uh, from a home improvement store perspective, but it could even be something like um, lying in my bed, looking out the window and recognizing that the angle of the landscape has changed because my physical perspective has changed. And then recognizing that these triggering experiences, whatever they may be, and they happen all the time, um, recognizing the significance of them, noticing that they are important. It's like the light bulb moment when you say, aha, that is interesting. 
And then I go from these triggering experiences and the recognition of their importance to um, thinking about, okay, what am I gonna do with this information? I'm super excited. How am I actually gonna put the gears into motion now and, and make something or do something about this? So I end up thinking about um, a lot of the, the, what methods and media I will utilize that sort of best convey the, the concepts and content of the work that I wanna create. And then um, also, of course, reading and writing, being part of it, researching, um, trying to find out more information uh, about the things that I'm thinking about. So if I'm thinking about, uh, again, using the example of the angle of the landscape, then maybe thinking about what other writing has been done about different perspectives from this distance uh, looking out the window and how these angles have changed and then start to recognize how that's been written about uh, from theory, from history, from an art historical perspective and to see what sticks. You know, it's almost like throwing something like pulp at a wall and then seeing what kinds of forms that they make, which ones slide down and what things remain. It's a bit like that in my process. So um, and like I said, the, the media that I utilize is very important. And that's why it is so, uh, my, you know, my focus is very uh, sort of interdisciplinary. And then the materials that I use are very multidisciplinary. So um, yeah, then I always have to think about, okay, now what is the, the presentation of this going to be? Is it going to end up being, you know, in an exhibition, an installation? Is it going to be something that is walked or is written? And as far as a, a daily practice, no, I'm, I mean, I'm rather organized and structured, that's for sure, but uh, I have, you know, specific goals that I like to reach, um, but I don't have like a, at two o'clock, I go for a walk in the woods every day, regardless of the weather conditions. So it's not that strict or stringent. I really think that it's based more on where I am, what's available, um, and um, how much time and effort I'm putting into it. So for me, I actually have a lot of different projects going on simultaneously. So that's why I like to also work with series is because in that way they are ongoing potentially. And then I can always come back to other, other parts because the more that I learn and the more that I think about them, uh, then they're going to inform each other. You know, it's almost like taking a bit of paint from one canvas and scraping it off and then throwing it onto the very next series that you're creating. So some of those remnants and residues from previous projects overlap and inform each other. Yeah, and that's beautiful. And yeah, you know, I, I can so relate, you know, when it comes to process, there isn't sometimes, oftentimes, there really isn't a linear trajectory, you just have to do several things at the same time. And, and sometimes those things start overlapping. Um, I was thinking about your websites, you have a very comprehensive website, and then an, an active Instagram account as well, where you regularly post new work. Um, and you, you know, in tandem also, you mentioned earlier that sometimes you create experiments specifically designed for, you know, for um, online viewing or on mobile devices specifically, like your plein air uh, painting series. Um, but talk, us, talk to us a bit more about your strategy for circulating your work and getting your work out of the studios and getting ready for exhibitions and residencies. You just mentioned that sometimes you know you have um, a project coming up, but I imagine sometimes experiments just kind of start somewhere. Um, and then um, maybe an opportunity to exhibit that work shows up later. How do you how do you think about circulating your work, and and in what ways um, do you find yourself being most successful with that? That's an excellent question. Um, I think that for me, I'm always putting you know sort of reaching out to see what is available. So I I am looking for different calls for or opportunities that relate to the things that I'm interested in. So um, I might apply to something like that. Um, it could be a residency or an exhibition if it seems like it's a theme or a topic that I'm really interested in. Um, so I, I'm always on the lookout for something and sometimes I get an invitation. Um, sometimes um, I end up, you know, through this networking that we were talking about within an arts community, of course, um, then discussing or maybe collaborating with other individuals. So. Um, it's really a wide array of, of ways in which the opportunities can present themselves or that I can make the opportunities more visible. Um, 
and to realize them. Of course, now the structure is a bit different in the pandemic. Um, online practices, as you mentioned, with websites and Instagram, among others, have become more and more essential. So trying to rethink those sorts of spaces, these virtual spaces as well, has become uh, imperative. So um, there are a couple of different things, like there is a residency, you, I've shown you some images of it in Switzerland, where I, I usually will be invited to go there every year. And so um, because the Alps have played such a huge role in the inspiration that I have for my work, you know, as I mentioned, Leipzig and uh, Columbus look very similar. There are no great mountain ranges in these areas. So when I saw the mountains, for me, it was just completely awe inspiring. And so that's a place where I do a lot of my research. Um, and then to counter that, of course, we have Venice. So um, places where the water ends up being a, a very uh, integral component of the environment. So I guess these kinds of extremes are things that I'm thinking about as well. Like what sorts of places do I want to go to? Um, do they present an interesting boundary or border? Uh, what, what could that be? How is that visualized? How is it advertised? Um, what do I think about it? What could I do with it once I'm there? You know, there's the tourism aspect, there's the amount of time that's there, um, there's the difference of experiencing a place, whether it's through an exhibition or an artist residency or visiting as a lecturer, where it's with usually within a limited amount of time. So um, realizing that that is going to also inform the, the work that I would create uh, either there or subsequently. Um, so, and I think to try to make that more palpable as well. So these different um, means, uh, it's always, again, changing to fit whatever uh, situation or um, opportunity that I want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And actually, I'm going to use this moment uh, to remind the audience uh, to feel free to submit any questions you might have. It looks like we have about 15 more minutes in this conversation. And of course, I have many more questions for Elizabeth, but, uh, but want to give an opportunity to you as well to ask questions. So this would be good, a good moment to type in any questions if you have questions and, and put them in the chat. But Elizabeth, I wanted to use this, um, this segue. You talked about the mountains. Um, and I'm thinking of some of your more recent pieces from 2020, um, which I think you made in, at the residency in Switzerland with a beautiful and uh, fleeting installation called Closer. And, and you actually showed that in your intro as well. If I can describe it again, it's this tall banner uh, shaped from uh, basically, or it's, it's shaped like a banner and it has a cutout at the bottom. I would say it's maybe roughly 13 feet tall or so, and then the bottom portion is a spray painted on semi-transparent paper, and it's hung from a pole outside within the background, this is beautiful, majestic mountain scene. And this paper is just sort of, you know, flapping in the wind. And in the accompanying video, you show the banner, you know, just doing that, and it's so fragile. And uh, I think, you know, just a matter of time really before the paper might tear or get tattered just because of nature's force. And in the close up of those images, you show the spray painted and shaped bottom of the banner, creating kind of a miniature mountain scene with mm -hmm. an accompanying sky, or at least that's what I see. And you write, um, I think you wrote something like bringing the seemingly unreachable, unreachable down to the, to the street level and shifting power structures. The focus of this work is on the flip side of conquest, exploring ephemerality and humility of human efforts in the face of nature. And I'm just, I can't help myself but think how poignant this meaning becomes now, you know, during this COVID pandemic and the ways, you know, we are rendered powerless in the face of global health crisis. And, you know, for me personally, so much of this year has been about humility and finding connections in new ways, you know, in, and I'm just so curious in, in what ways or other ways that the pandemic may have impacted your practice or your work in terms of restrictions and opportunities. I know that you said that forced into the lockdown, we are compelled to view things from the insides, looking out. So, you know, taking a different kind of perspective. 
So I'm really curious to hear a little more about that. Oh, and I'm really glad that you asked. Um, actually, I have some additional images prepared of the work that I've been doing in the studio. If um, I have the opportunity to share them right now, that would be great. Yeah, I think that would be good. Okay, just a few moments actually. All right. So with this, uh, the new projects, actually, this is perhaps the best known work of German romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich. And, uh, you know, we're talking about mountains in the perspective, right? So it's completely appropriate. And here I am assuming the position in front of the original painting, I simply couldn't help myself. So with the current situation being what it is, this image has been popping up on social media, which also eerily sort of encapsulates many of the concepts that are addressed within my own recent work. So I've been fascinated by the function of windows to both connect and distance, existing somewhere between interior and exterior, a framing device and a precipice blurring between public and private, inside and outside and also the role of light and shadows, those that are real and implied and the relationship to fears. So for example, illuminating particles floating in the air and casting familiar objects into doubt. So windows have been a focus of my work for years and considering the ways boundless forms are contained and framed within our own walls and screens. Shadows uh, also offering a kind of shadowy ambiguity and atmospheric combination of unexacted ideas and images. And these are imbued with endless symbolism and nuance. They act as a barrier and escape. They're now utterly disjointed and saturated with such yearning. So our relationship, yes, to interior and exterior environments, it has been shaped in ways that we've never really imagined until recently. And I see rethinking the window as also an opportunity to reevaluate the power of transition from what has been to what will be. So these new projects, which are still in progress, for me, they stem from a practice of these visions, sharpening comparative looking that we were talking about. Um, but yet now working from an isolated interior, I currently find myself looking through rather than at and in a space where constructing views outwards and searching for their connections carry with them ultimately views inwards, which for me are utterly steeped these days in desire and longing. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's funny because I think that exactly addressed one of the questions from the audience um, asking about, you know, what new ideas you might be playing with right now. So, so that was perfect. Some other questions that we receive focus on any advice you might have um, for our students interested in moving abroad potentially. But, and then in tandem with that, um, any kind of significant advice that you received, you know, specifically while you were in school um, about, you know, how to move forward. Um, try to utilize you, the, your peers as well as your professors and your mentors um, as much as possible, especially as your student. I really wish that actually I'd explored more of those possibilities while I was in school. It was something that I did afterwards. You know, hindsight's always 2020. I think that, you know, being able to maintain that level of energy and enthusiasm, regardless of what it is that you want to try to pursue, um, is also incredibly important, you know, because you need to cultivate this. For educators, you need to do that within their students, and then also students to be able to maintain that and I think that that really helps to uh, maintain it sort of an active engagement. So um, yeah, I guess the advice that I would offer is to try to be, you know, be seeing all the aspects of life as interconnected and to try to um, think about ways in which we're tied to our environments and how we are as much a product of our environments as our environments are a product of us. And that's something that we will take with us no matter where we're located. So um, that maybe geographic distance doesn't necessarily provide more perspective. That's something that needs to be uh, cultivated from within. So um, 
yeah, just uh, utilize the sources that are available to you. Try to do as much research, ask as many questions. Sometimes it comes from people that you wouldn't necessarily expect it to come from. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's excellent advice. Use your peers, use the people around you. You know, think about this network idea. Don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, totally. Um, I wanted to use these last few minutes uh, to talk a little bit more about your current teaching. Um, so you teach at the Academy of Fine Arts in Leipzig. And I know that this year you've also taught in the US. You were a visiting artist in 2020 at the School of the Art Institute at Chicago. And you were a visiting artist in the Graduate Studies Department at CCAD. Um, Specifically, can you speak to the shift that you made in deciding to teach in Germany? You know, was it difficult to find or create those opportunities? And uh, what, what classes are you currently teaching there? So I'm currently teaching, and I have been teaching for a number of years, a, a seminar course. It's actually uh, related to a course that I was teaching at OSU, uh, professional development course. So, um, and it's a seminar that's offered to all of the students at the Art Academy. So I get to work with a really wide range of students. It's, it's pretty incredible. This position did not exist. This class did not exist. So again, this is what I mean about trying to recognize what your strengths are and to try to create the opportunities that you want. So um, to see happening, I think that this is something that's incredibly important uh, to do. So um, yeah, um, how, teaching, let me think. I, I can't not teach, I feel like, just like I can't not make art. It is something, it's just who I am. So I feel like it's I, there is something lacking when I'm not able to be in that sort of an environment because you know I'm learning just as much as hopefully my students are. I'm learning as much from them. It really informs my practice, um, you know, uh, my artistic practice, my pedagogical practice. I see them as interconnected. So um, it was something that's absolutely necessary for me to do. And I started by uh, offering private classes in my studio when I first came to Germany. So again, it's just meeting people and trying to create those opportunities um, and sticking with it and knowing what it is that you really want to do. And for me, I knew that I wanted to teach and I wanted to make art. And that's probably what I'll be doing regardless of where I am. Fantastic. We just got another uh, question. This one is from Richard Fletcher. Um, um, he says, the current vision of the Barnett Center is a place where students can learn skills and abilities that equip them to be successful in the arts. Um, and then he's asking, what are the skills and abilities that you wish you had learned during your studies that would have better equipped you for your art career? Well, as the future is unknown and as skills can always be developed depending on what skills are necessary at the moment, we, we don't really know what's gonna be in the future. So I think that the skill of adaptability is one of the most important, especially to meet the needs of a future world that is yet to come. So teaching students how to um, be able to engage in critical thinking and analysis on their own and to sustain that enthusiasm that I was talking about before. Those are incredibly important skills to teach. Yeah. Wonderful. I feel I'm looking, I'm just looking at the time. I think there's room for one last question. In fact, there's a question from the audience, um, which kind of takes it us back to your work, which I'm happy about. Um, Peter says, do you see Venice as a prime metaphor of the conflict between civilization and wilderness? And he says, I would very much be interested in reading anything you have written on this subject. And I, I think it's a beautiful way, in fact, to close out kind of this conversation too. Um, as you've talked very much about, you know, using your images as, as ways to shape and change what we see and also as a form of protest at times, you know, to combat fear and to create awareness around this. So um, if you don't mind answering or at least addressing Peter's question around that. Yes, Peter, absolutely. I mean, Venice has been called the double-faced Medusa. So I think that those two aspects, in addition to more of these contrasts and binaries are completely uh, present within that city. It's an amazing place, absolutely, so, yeah. And have you done any writing specifically around that, Elizabeth, that you can share? 
I have, and actually um, there is a recent article that I had forwarded to you that uh, spent a lot of time discussing um, this work uh, specifically, and that had been through an interview discussion uh, with some of my writings. So um, yeah, I can try to provide some links uh, if possible, but yeah. That'd be great. And uh, I think uh, that can be probably included in the follow-up email that goes out to folks who attended the seminar. I'm going to, since we're running out of time, um, I'm going to turn this back over to Alison Cressetta to, uh, to wrap things up. Um, this was just such an honor, Elizabeth, to be able to talk with you. Um, like I said, so many more questions, but that might have to be a, a private Zoom meeting or perhaps a follow-up Zoom meeting that we can do um, with an audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I just want to say thank you both to Mariah and Elizabeth for such a lovely conversation and thank you to our audience members who offered questions in the chat. I do hope that you will join us for the rest of this Creative Pathfinders series. We're just getting started and uh, uh, please see our website. We'll uh, be sending that um, as a follow up too, where you can find out about the other events and there's plenty of time to register for those events. I guess I was just so, so moved today by this notion of um, really working through and into our, our networks and not being afraid to take chances in our professional life and to um, also be willing to maybe um, reach out into new territories, both literal in terms of the landscape, but also cultural um, and to create opportunities where there were no opportunities. I think this is a, the entrepreneurial spirit that the Barnett Center is uh, very aware of that we need to continue to cultivate, not only for our students now, but uh, to remember and to learn from our alumni as well. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for preparing such a lovely presentation about your work and for joining us this afternoon for this first uh, of, I hope, many conversations of this nature at the Barnett Center. <laughs>